Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let us go back and look at the last part of the argument which we were making a while ago about the potential political conflict inherent in the interests of the workers and the capitalists or other employers in Smithian system in the determination of subsistence wage. At this point, I must also add that Smith had a clear distinction to make between productive and unproductive labor. Productive labor was that labor which was capable of producing surplus, such as a worker in a factory, worker in agricultural field or farm, whereas unproductive labor was all the labor which was employed in, em, employed in maintaining personal services to people like the butlers and uh, cooks and so on and so forth, who were just providing consumption to people and not generally generating surplus. This definition of course, has been questioned in recent times, when uh, the idea of protect, productive labor itself has come, uh, come under question in the last 50 years, especially in dealing with census. We will come to it shortly. But at this point in time, I just want to state that Smith regarded all personal service as unproductive and all uh, employment under somebody as product, productive labor and personal service was unproductive labor. Sorry. So, even among productive labor as we have seen whether they got subsistence, subsistence wage or above that was strictly a function of the political economy and in the long run political economy suggested that these people should get around subsistence wage, which was according to Smith the normal thing. Let us look at this a little bit in detail, because this is one huge area which took off from Smith in the 19th century. The potential conflict between the capitalists and the workers. In the 19th century, as capitalism grew very rapidly in England and also in France and Germany, rest of Europe and in the United States, the conflict in the interests of the workers and conflict between the interests of the workers and the interests of the capitalists became more and more pronounced. Not merely in the question of wages paid but regard to the question of the terms and conditions of employment. There is a little piece which is reported in French writing on the subject in early 19th century, about a little survey which was undertaken in French industry in one of the provinces to estimate the cost of production. And they found that uniformly the employers, the capitalists who employed the workers had included one item uniformly in the cost of maintenance of the factory. This was a cane, a cane which they used to beat workers wets if they were not efficient enough. So, the cost of this cane was accounted for as item required to maintain production like a raw material. Now, this I think is a very telling illustration of who controlled the conditions of work and that is how this particular book which refers to this, this particular episode looks at it too. They said look if this is what was an accounting practice. I mean that an employer could 
have a cane with regular purpose of beating the workers if he slacked on work, it shows who was favored by the system. So, the big question that came up in the 19th century was A, was there any good coming out of capitalist system at all to the society and B, what price had to be paid for this good coming for the society. One good thing that appeared to come into the hands of people is the access to vast number of goods and services which happened as industries grew, as manufacturing grew. So, people got used to more consumption and more consumption through time. So, the levels of consumption, the quality of living, all of them seem to, standard of living seem to increase. Quality of living is a different issue. <coughs> this was one benefit. The other benefit of course, were the profits made by the capitalists. Capital was accumulated in the economy, levels of technology grew. The incidental thing in this was the growth of science and research and knowledge in this process, this was also a benefit to the society. The other question which was asked was at what cost? And this is where the socialists and Marx had something to say. They say it happened entirely at the cost of a large segment of the population which constituted the working class. In England, for instance, in the 1820s, it was estimated that the average lifespan of a child joining to work in a factory was not more than 22 years. In other words, a child joined to work in a factory at the age of 11, 12 something, it was assumed that the child would usually not live beyond 22 years old. One of the principal killers in the textile mills and the factories in England at that time was consumption. What is consumption? Not, not, not eating ice cream though, tuberculosis, yes. Tuberculosis used to be known as consumption. It was a big killer. The, the air in the factory was not breathable. It was dense, it was polluted and long hours of work without a break in closed atmospheres, usually children. So, the conditions in factory were pretty bad. So, you know when uh, Charles Dickens writes about the condition of the poor in England at that time, it is very realistic. Dickens in England is very, very realistic in terms of the social contrast uh, in the contrasts. You had extremely poor, poor and extremely rich, rich. So, not only poor, poor, not in the sense of having been deprived of their rights to food and habitat and so on and so forth, but in terms of whom they were working for. Did I work 10 hours a day so that you might get your profit? when I needed to work only for 3 hours for my sustenance, for my food, this is a question of the surplus, which originates in Smith, which originates in physiocrats. It is very benign in physiocrats, because the poor thing which suffers is only land. Everybody exploits land, but land does not complain. But in all other systems, it is labor after Smith and during Smith. And then labor does complain, because labor says it is my production, my output and you are taking it away. So, that is social conflict. So, the basic question was surplus labor and surplus output. This became the heart of all socialist critique and the finest socialist critique was Marx. Marx's entire effort was devoted to show that human history is nothing but a succession of methods of exploiting labor. 
under different modes of production and different manners of extracting the surplus. And according to him capitalism was the mode in which it, it was exploited exclusively through the market and the slavery the slave the master owned the slave and therefore his labor power and the serfdom the, uh, the labor was tied to land and whoever owned the land controlled the labor power but under capitalism as marx says the labor had perfect freedom to consider himself as nothing but a commodity there was nothing which belonged to the labor by definition he was a commodity and this was the most unique thing about capitalism in the sense that the divorce between what the labor produced and labor was final and complete. In all other systems there was some connection between what the labor produced and labor, but under capitalism since labor itself had become a commodity the divorce was complete. We will talk more about Marx later, but at this point in time you can see where Smith's almost benign writing on the formation of surplus and the formation of subsistence wage leads to it led to communist manifesto where Marx says workers of the world unite you have nothing to lose but your chains that is as far as the implications of Smith reaching in the next century. Okay, now let us see the three broad thrusts in the work of Smith. Smith was writing almost about everything all the time, but in the next century and in the century after which is the 19th and 20th century three very distinctive lines of thought and research developed all owing themselves to something or other in what Smith was saying. One was a growth theory which was essentially based on the theory of distribution of Adam Smith. It is fairly simple. labor is the source of surplus, capitalist is the source of capital, capital is used in organizing labor in different ways creating division of labor, capital is also used in creating technology and suitable infrastructure in which division of labor could occur even more rapidly. So, the combination of capitalist and the worker is growth because the combination of these two is a source of surplus. Labor produces and delivers the surplus, capitalist creates the conditions under which the surplus can happen. So, essentially Smith's theory of distribution starts off the theory of growth. The national output is divided into the share of the rentier class, the landlords the share of the capitalists the profits and then the share of the worker which is the wage bill. It was not Smith who said this Smith was only saying that uh, uh, subsistence wage is normal, but Smith's followers went a bit further and then they said the wage bill was constant. What is a wage bill? Who can tell me? You are not there. Krishna, what is the wage bill? Anybody? Sharanya, no? Well, it is okay, it is all right if you do not know because you probably never studied wage bill 
before, the wage bill is a share of the national product that went to the workers. Smith was not talking specifically about wage bills. When he talked of distribution, he was not talking of wage bill is so much, profit is so much, no. He's basically talking of directions into which the surplus went. But it is Smith's followers, Ricardo and so on and so forth, who talked of wage bill being limited, fixed, which is even more strong a statement than subsistence wage. So, the Smith, I am sorry, the Ricardo Malthus approach gave a new direction to this theory of distribution. We will talk about it later, but right now it was a theory which said that all that the labor got out of the national income was a fixed amount and this was distributed among all the workers. So, if the population of the laborers increased, wages went below subsistence and the population declined, wages rose again and subsistence wage was reached. So, there was some kind of a labor population which was identified as being typical of a particular economy and subsistence wage together they gave you the wage bill which was what they got out of the national income and this was said to have been fixed, it does not change because demand for labor will not increase it, increase the wage level. If demand for labor pushes the wage level, then the workers according to both Smith and his followers would lead to, would, would uh, end up in absenteeism. If the wage went up, they would work one day and say they have got enough for two days and sit back and eat. So, their understanding of workers was people who shirked work. So, they had what we saw earlier arising out of the mercantilists as very much their own labor supply function which was a backward bending labor supply function. As wages rose, rose above and further and further above subsistence levels, you had the labor supply function bending backwards. In other words, labor supplied shrinks. So, because of this, because of this, wages increase above the subsistence level. When the wages increase further above subsistence level, according to Malthus and others of his time, labor indulged itself and wasted itself such that the population of labor declined and once again subsistence wage was restored. So, you had a constant subsistence wage and a constant wage bill argument being put together by a strange demography. This was classical economics, but I am saying this not because Smith said it, I am saying this is different from what Smith said. Smith only argued that subsistence wage was natural. We we'll look at all these things when we talk about Ricardo and others next week. So, this theory of distribution is pretty much the heart of all growth theories even today. Consider for instance the Harrod Domer growth model. Have you studied that? The Harrod Domer growth model? Have you studied it in any part of the economics so far? Okay. So, so what was mentioned there? How saving goes into investment increasing saving. I mean we do not know the actual equation. Mm -hmm. So it is okay. Do you know that in the Harrod Domer model there is an assumption that are there are three growth rates. There is a natural growth rate, there is a warranted growth rate and there is an actual growth rate. Have you heard of that? 
there is a natural growth rate which is the growth rate permitted by the growth of population which is determined by labor supply the warranted growth rate is the growth rate enabled by the growth of capital and capital formation so the actual growth rate lies somewhere between the natural and warranted growth rate in the harrod domer model the upper bounds to growth are given by the ability to form capital is given by saving and investment basically the lower bound which is natural growth rate is given by population growth rates basically because eventually population growth rates tell you the rate at which labor is growing and therefore the minimum rate at which the output can grow which is the rate of growth of population so once again you see labor at the heart of modern growth rates growth models too in smithian system there is no upper bound but the distribution between the capitalist the labor and the landlord ensured that capital accumulated in the hands of the capitalist and provided the basis for growth and there is no population assumption by smith for instance unless the, unlike the mercantilist he didn't assume that the population of labor should be continued to be encouraged to grow you remember the mercantilist said that the government should encourage the growth of population because more workers is more production in the malthusian scheme after marx after uh, smith population remains stagnant it goes through ups and downs but it is stagnant because that's the economics of population there in smith there is no such assumption about population either that government should make it grow or it doesn't grow smith is not specifically worried about population growth rates he says is division of labor more and more division of labor just enables more and more productivity in the hands of each worker so that's what he focuses on so you have a growth model coming out of this and a growth model which is also the marxian growth model which is also as i told you something like the harrod domer growth model in modern times so the seed and the kernel of macroeconomic growth models is one part of smithian writing the other part of smithian writing is the whole of microeconomics as you study today the whole of microeconomics the simple idea that markets are in equilibrium not even that markets are in equilibrium let's look at smithian theory of value smith says the labor is the basis of creation of value does it mean that the cost of production in the smithian system is is the wages paid to the labor times the number of hours labor works no smith also says there is a normal profit in the system which should go into the cost of production there is a rent in the system which should go into the cost of production so the cost of production is not very clear in smith's writing he talks of labor as being the basis of value but at the same time you have uh, capital the price of capital rent etc they are not residual items they are added on positively so value is according to cost of production cost is according to cost of production exchange value happens because of the interaction between demand and supply as the demand goes up given a cost of production exchange value goes up so you have cost and you have exchange value smith says that there is also use value of goods which is why they are bought but that's where it stops there is no analysis of demand side in in smith proper use value people buy it 
then what is the basis of demand and uh, how does demand behave over time. These analyses did not figure in Smith very much. He was essentially a supply side economist. He was thinking of how output came, how costs were determined and so forth. So, that is one. Smith also said that this market price which is exchange value differed from what he called was a normal price or a natural price. This normal or natural price is some kind of a long run equilibrium price. Something which we saw in Galliani, for instance. In Galliani, we saw there is a long run price and there is a short run price and short run price is full of external disturbances, long run price is not. So, there is a belief here rather than proven knowledge, there is a belief here in these people that the forces of demand and supply in the long run created an exchange value which was some kind of a long run equilibrium value around which the short term exchange price fluctuated. This was the heart of their natural order in Smith, in Galliani and in physiocrats who also believed in a long run price. As I said this is belief more than a proven knowledge because nobody in those days had statistics, statistical instruments with which they could verify long term values, time series analysis these things did not exist at that time. But the fact remains that they did believe that in the long run wages would stabilize around subsistence wage and there would be normal profits, there would be rents which is a normal rent till Ricardo came they thought rent was a part of the cost that is a different issue Ricardo thought otherwise. But so everything was a normal stable part in the long run and therefore there is a long run normal price which was a natural price around which short term exchange values fluctuated. As I said this is attributed to Smith but we have seen that this is there in Galliani it is there implicitly in the physiocrats, it was just the belief of the times. All those guys believed that there is in the long run the competitive market economy ensured some stability and stable values. So, okay, this was one gift of Smith to his followers that there is a long run price which is stable. But beyond that Smith was not talking much about the market. He talked, he talked about market as a source, as an inspiration for growth, inspiration for division of labor and so forth, but what markets did, how they functioned he was not writing very much about it. It was his followers in the 19th century who took it up seriously. Bentham took up the demand side of the market. He said goods are bought because they have utility. all commodities have a power to satisfy wants and all actions had utility. Therefore, eventually it is the utility which determined the demand for goods and it is the utility which in the long run lay at the heart of determin determination of long run price. So, this was the utilitarian direction in which Smith's ideas went of some kind of a market equilibrium. And in the utilitarians this went one step further that utility should also become a normative principle because utilitarianism as we shall see was consequentialist which means all actions all events should be judged only according to the utility that was gained out of it. So, the second direction of Smith's writing related to equilibrium in equilibria in market and one offshoot of this was Bentham's writings. 
the other offshoot two major offshoots in the 19th century one came in the writings of say the french economist who virtually argued that it is impossible for the system free market to result in over production in other words you can never have excess supply in the system general over production is not possible in the market economy this was says conclusion from his analysis we'll come to that later but this was stating that not just that markets would be in equilibrium in the long run but the whole of the capitalist market system is a guarantee for stability and this was reasserted some 40 years later after say had written in the writings of leon walrop had did you ever study general equilibrium in theory microeconomics you will okay so i'll do a little bit of introduction to that later when i'm talking about say and so forth but the general equilibrium analysis showed mathematically how a million atoms called economic actors could get together and create a system where at simultaneous equilibria were attained in every market and the whole system was continuously constantly and simultaneously in an equilibrium in other words the bliss the, that the market economy was supposed to guarantee was at least proven in a set of simultaneous equations in the writings of leon walrop that's the second direction in which smith's writing took i won't say much details about it because the whole of neoclassical economics is an offshoot of say walrop and then marshall jevons they are all talking about equilibria in capitalist economies and equilibrium conditions as necessary conditions of efficiency of the capitalist economy and any movement away from equilibria considered as market failures and market failure is a pejorative terminology because it simply doesn't mean disequilibrium it means market failure the system has failed so you had that whole direction which developed and developed and developed and still developing as modern microeconomics neoclassical economics and after 1960 with the development of rational expectations hypothesis in the writings of lucas as new classical economics so the 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 bulk of hardcore theory which is studied today goes back to the second direction of adam smith which is the theory of market equilibrium now the third part is something which is less talked about much less talked about but for personal reasons i find that the most fascinating part of smith because i have a personal fascination for institutional economics and a large part of present day institutional economics i would say is not inspired by adam smith so much but features as a precursor to modern writing in his own words what is institutional economics can somebody tell me have you heard of it anybody take a shot you know and don ke raj mein kana raja you cannot say the wrong thing because nobody will know it so just say it. take a shot it's got to do with institutions that much you can say no so okay what's what's it got to do with institutions it's basically the economics of how institutions function and it's the economics of how institutions come about and what institutions do in an economy i'll just take up three or four areas in the vast discourse of institutional economics 
as illustrations to show how on all of these Smith had a little thing to say. The concept of transaction costs. Have you heard of Robert Coase? Have you been taught Robert Coase? Coasean transaction costs, Coase theorem. It is not really as big as it sounds. Coase theorem is another way of talking about externalities. Do you know what externalities are? Tell me what externalities are. Some external influences affecting your uh, your activities or something like that. Like fate. Hmm? Like fate. Fate. Not. I don't know about fate. I think that's too general a word. Hmm. Maybe something like um, externalities could be. Uh, um. It's out outcome of market, which, hmm. which uh, influence players, people who are outside 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 the market, like that particular. Market. Do not take part in that. That particular this thing activity. Can you give me an example? Are you acquainted with the name of Pico? Yes. And talk Pico. about externalities. Pigovian taxes. Pigovian taxes. Pigovian taxes. Okay, that's to do with externalities. Absolutely. Do you recollect something out of that? Yes. Lovely. Say it. Say it out. You're you're on the right track. Yes, pollution. Um, say, using water from a river and uh, leaving I mean, the, the if if the effluent is going in the water, I mean after 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 uses, and then it it is I mean since this water is used by some other people, so it's externality. It's an example of externality for them, those people because. Firm doesn't take that into its profit and loss accounts. Okay, which part of economics did you study all this? Principles. Principles. Oh, right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Long, long time back, no? Mm -hmm. Poor things. <laughs> well, okay, you're not far wrong. Actually, you're not wrong at all. Um, have you thought? Have you heard of social costs? Pigo is connected with that, no? Externalities are connected with that. Take Pigou's example. Say somebody starts a factory in a residential area. The private cost of producing whatever he is producing in that private factory is the cost of various raw materials, inputs, and so forth, which goes into that and divided by the total output, it gives you average cost. That is private cost. But what it does not include for instance is the cost of abatement of pollution. You might be releasing vast quantities, vast quantities of smoke into that area which might lead to all kinds of respiratory disorders. So, the cost of building a hospital, diagnosing people, treating them for it, curing them from it and preventive care of further disorder of this type is a whole budget which is not included in the private costs of that little factory in the residential area. No? So, whenever private costs are lower than the social costs, social costs are this private cost plus all other costs for the society as a whole for the starting of this factory. So, whenever private costs are lower than social costs, you say that there are negative externalities. Sometimes economics is also decent because it talks of hypothetical situations where private costs could be actually higher than social costs. Take the case which is given by Mead in his discussion of externalities. Mead talks of an apple grower and a beekeeper. The beekeeper's production function is quantity of honey is a function of labor he puts into the beehives. The apple orchard 
key per production function is quantity of apples produced is a function of labor put into cultivation of apples simple no private cost function. So, in each case private for cost is cost relating directly to what you do to your product, but look at this during the year the bees keep flying in the apple orchard looking for honey in the apple flowers apple blossoms and they bring the honey and the honey is collected in the beehives in the beekeepers establishment. Now the apple blossom happen not because the beekeeper wants it the apple blossoms happen because it is natural for apple trees to blossom in a particular cycle during the year right. So, the responsibility for the coming into existence of apple blossoms is the responsibility of or the effort of the apple orchard keeper the beekeeper has no role over it no yet he spends money in cultivating his apples and that effort leads to the honey in the apple blossoms which brings in the honey into the hives. So, there are two types of labor which go into every liter of honey that is produced one the labor of the beekeepers and the labor of the apple keeper. So, it should be Q which is the product of output of honey is a function of L B which is the labor of beekeeper and L A which is the labor of the apple keeper. So, the labor is actually two people's labor social cost of growing I mean having a liter of honey is two people's labor, but private cost is only one person's labor. So, here is a case where there is a positive social externality right the good thing in the same way cost of every basket of apples is a big part played by the bees if they were not there who would pollinate the apple blossoms it is the bees who come and look for the honey and in the process pollinate all the apple blossoms and that leads to the apples. So, every basket of apples has two effort functions there one is the effort of the apple keeper another is the effort of the bee keeper is not it. So, this is positive externality. So, whenever there is a variation between social costs and private costs you immediately say there is externality involved depend upon which direction the variation is is that clear. Now, in modern times that is in the 1960s Pigou was talking about this sort of thing Mead was talking about this sort of thing in the 1920s 1930s, but Coarsian externalities came about in 1960 Coase was talking about two people let us say who buy plots of land in an in an industrial estate adjacent to each other. So, all the papers are intact and their rights titles everything is perfect there is no crookery there is no misrepresentation there is nothing going on. all is clean deal. So, one fellow starts a hospital in one of the plots in the next plot the other fellow starts a bread making confectionery which is fine after a while the person who has the hospital goes to the bread factory owner and says brother I have a problem what is the problem says the other he says well you see day in and day out in your factory in your basement your machines are pounding away the flour they are pounding pounding and pounding grains into flour to with which to make your bread and that thing is shocking the very foundations of my hospital and my patients have all kinds of reactions out of that and I happen to have three or four, four patients die every month because of that negative externality am I not right. But what kind of negative externality it is it is it it is something over which the society has no basic control because the titles to the property are perfect and so forth you know there is problem there. So, Coase says there is a cost involved here and the cost is transaction cost in the sense one of them has to compensate the other to re relocate. 
if he does not relocate then both of them are stuck and one of them has to accept that he has to relocate and accept a compensation. <coughs> so, this is the quotient transaction cost, but more than that there is a instrument which enables you to negotiate which is the court, there is a law which tells you what you can do and what you cannot do in such situations civil law. So, you have a whole apparatus of judiciary, you have a whole apparatus of government all of which constitute quotient can transaction costs right. Now, the reason I am mentioning this is in Smith's writing there is a mention how, how the system becomes inefficient when there are too many disputes because of the greed of individual entrepreneurs is pretty much a quotient transaction cost kind of a discussion. But quotient the Smithian resolution of it is not that the government should become stronger as a mediator once again Smith says the eventual resolution will happen when the impartial observer becomes stronger and advocates both people in both people in action which is sensible from both points of view that they can negotiate and settle it. This is pretty much a kind of a predecessor to quotient argument. So, one, one aspect of institutional economics is the discussion on transaction costs a lot of it goes back to Smith. Another aspect of institutional economics is the idea of bounded rationality. Have you heard of bounded rationality? Simon, Herbert Simon, because I see some of you nodding. In fantastic, it is everywhere. Can you tell me how it is? What you may know, what you know about, what you may know is actually maybe a bounded rationality. It's like an information asymmetry. Okay, okay, okay. Fine, lovely, lovely. That's perfect, beautiful. Now, in the 1940s, Herbert Simon, a psychologist, started studying organizations and organizational behavior, and in so doing. He ended up understanding that organizations do not behave rationally, they do not be believe in terms of particular objectives and some kind of a linear program or an integer program for methodology to attain these objectives. He said the objectives are very many and very often fulfilling one objective clashes with the other. So, there is a continuous compromise which business leadership and organizational leadership is involved in. And they are rational in the sense that they are reaching a compromise decision with respect to all these objectives. So, it is a bounded rationality. The next direction of say Simon's argument is the boundaries to rationality may be in the environment like this, the boundaries to rationality are actually in the human mind. There are so many drives to the human mind that each block the other. So, the human activity all the time is some kind of a compromise between the different facets of the human mind like a bounded rationality in an organization. Now, this kind of bounded rationality is precisely what you have seen today Smith's man is dealing with. There are so many drives and he is all the time trying to attain a via media a compromise among these. So, probably Theoretical discussion on brown bounded rationality occurred in Smith very lucidly and very clearly some 170 years before Simon was writing about it in the 1940s. Simon need not have plagiarized his, uh, Smith, no Simon was writing something on his own, but once again the idea is that Smith was so vast and so wide in the terrain that he commanded that even bounded rationality figures very comfortably in his very definition of the moral sentiments. So, we have seen three broad directions of Smith's writings and we find that in every sense of these he is a predecessor.
to a lot of debates that happened in the 19th century and in the 20th century and in the 21st century too, whether it is the growth theory, theories of distribution or whether it is whole the theory of equilibrium, neoclassical economics or whether we are talking of modern institutional economics. And in all these respects, you find three broad directions in the writings of Smith, which enable creative thinking much later. Have a nice weekend.